this will stay on Facebook Live for um, so you can view it at your pleasure there um, if you have to step away. And we'll also put it on our YouTube page um, so you'll be able to see the recording there as well. So let's get the show going. So Ted Williams writes full-time on fish and wildlife issues in a monthly, re quote, recovery column for the Natural Conservation, con cons I knew I was going to have trouble with this word, Conservancies, Cool Green Science, and in various other publications. A longtime contributor to Audubon Magazine, Williams was recognized by the Outdoor Writers Association of America as the nation's best outdoor columnist and has received numerous other national writing and conservation awards. He serves as national chair of the Native Fish Coalition and lives in Grafton, Massachusetts. And joining him this evening, scientist, science journalist Wendy Williams has spent her life outdoors, either on the back of a horse, on skis, or on her own two feet. She has spent a great deal of time in a variety of countries in Africa, walking in the fields and forests of Europe, and exploring North American mountain chains and prairies. She lives on Cape Cod in Massachusetts with her husband and her border collie Taff. She is the author of The Language of Butterflies and the Horse. Welcome, Wendy. Welcome, Ted. Have a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Am I going to get to see Ted? I don't think so. Not the way your tech is working. If you don't see him now, you're probably uh, not going to see him. Oh, too bad. But, but maybe. Well, we'll Ted, have to we'll see when he starts talking. The phone. Are you there, the Ted? I see you. The last time we saw Ted was 35 years oh, ago. There you <laughs> do an article on diamondback carapids. Uh-huh. Well, we see each other on the computer now, right? Great. Hi, Ted, are you there? I am. Hi, Wendy. Great, great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks Good. for doing this. Oh, I love it. I just, Ted, I just love your book. I, I um, your writing is so classic. It's so careful and meticulously crafted. It's just so enjoyable. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the variety of, of um, information that you have in this book that each of these little life forms that you decide to address, whether it's a plant or an animal or an insect, it's, it's just a little gem of its own. So I wanted to know where did you get this depth of knowledge from? Because this book shows an incredible depth of knowledge and real love of detail that makes this animal come alive or the plant come alive. Where did you get that from? A lot of it from my editor, Connie Isbell, who oh. gave me most of the ideas. And then I, I talked to a lot of biologists, and interviewed them, and collected some info and, and uh, kind of put it all together. And then we ran it to our, our fact checker at Audubon. So it was... Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is your curiosity is so widespread. It's not that you are interested in plants. It's not that you're interested in uh, animals or fish. You're interested in everything, and you really do a beautiful job with each little life form that you decide to tackle. For example, I wanted to say, obviously I'm interested in butterflies. But in your book, I learned a tremendous amount of things that I did not know about butterflies. I love your essay that starts on page 40 called Winter Butterflies. And I was thinking maybe if it's all right, I would read that for people. Is that okay with you? That would be great. Then I'll read you another one on butterflies. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll do butterflies back and forth. That'll be fun. Sure. This, this essay is called Winter Butterflies. And like most of the essays, they're very short. They're just two paragraphs. So there's a lot to think about in just two paragraphs. That's what I love. There is snow in the woods and ice on the ponds. So why are black, purple, and yellow trimmed butterflies sailing over the chaff of last year's lawn? How could they have hatched so soon? They didn't. They hibernated as adults in deep crevices and under bark. A month hence, Hence, they will feed on nectar and rotten fruit. Now they sip sap from the ice splintered deep scraped branches of birch and maple. Morning cloaks, as they are aptly called, are among the most widely distributed of all butterflies. You can find them in Eurasia, Mexico, and all of North America, from the wilds of Alaska to the sidewalks of Manhattan. 
In northern latitudes, they also hibernate during the summer, re-emerging in fall. In spring, look for their dramatic mating dance. A pair will spiral straight up for 60 feet, couple and probably mate. Then one drops to the ground as if hit by a windshield. I love that essay for so many reasons. First of all, I've asked myself that same question. Morning cloaks are the first butterflies that you can see where I live on Cape Cod. And they're out there when nothing else is out there. And, you know, you have to wonder, how did they get here? Well, now you've answered that question for me. It's also amazing to me that they can sip sap from branches of birch and maple. I didn't know that. They're very versatile. And like you pointed out, they can live in the wilderness of Mexico or they can live on the sidewalks of Manhattan. This is just such a wonderful essay to make us sit up and take notice and think about the things that go on on our planet that we don't know anything about. What is it that, that you liked best about this essay that made you write about this? Well, I, I like all butterflies. This, these are, we're going to some of my favorites. And I thought I knew a lot about butterflies. I collected them until I read your book, The Language of Butterflies. <laughs> And I learned. Well, isn't that the treasure of all books? That's really the treasure of all books, is that getting into another author's mind is just a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's so much fun. It really is. And yeah. uh, you you taught me all kinds of things that I never knew. Well, here's another, you have, okay. here's another essay about butterflies. It may have seen, uh, it's called Eyes South. And correct me if I've got anything wrong. Throughout most of the United States, buckeye butterflies are wafting south, sometimes in concentrations that rival the famous fall migration of monarchs. Look for these mid-sized butterflies in clearings and along meadow edges as they fuel up on the nectar of asters and other late-blooming wildflowers. Often, they'll be perched on a protruding branch or on the ground. If another insect passes close by, they'll likely give chase and return to their posts. Six striking multicolored eye spots, two on each hind wing and one on the forewing, are thought to frighten insectivorous, insectivorous birds. Adults live for only about 10 days, but butterflies of the last brood can overwinter if they make it to the southern states and countries. In spring, buckeyes breed themselves back to their summer habitat rolling north in waves of successive generations. I love that essay too. In fact, I posted that on my Facebook page, you might remember with your permission. Okay. Because I, I, th I think we forget, we, uh, we emphasize the migration of the monarch butterfly so much that we don't really realize there are a lot of butterflies that migrate like that, including the one that you chose to talk about, the wonderful buckeye butterfly. Right. So, so Ted, here's a question I want to ask you. This book, to me, I read as a culmination of your professional career as a nature and science writer. What was it that made you decide to adopt that career? You could have done anything. Why did you do this? I was always interested in, in fish and wildlife, and uh, I went to work for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife in uh, 1970, and I was their editor um, for their magazine for five years, and then I went freelancing for uh, fish and wildlife articles for magazines. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, profession, there's only one profession you can, uh, can uh, do that uh, you can make less money on, and that's... Uh, Saltwater guiding for fish, <laughs> yeah, for game fish. That's that's my next ambition. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I can, I can tell you right now, and when the when the kids ask me, I say, if you want to make money, this is not the thing for you to do. If you right. want to have a wonder, if you want to have a wonderful life, then you might choose this. But you're never going to get rich doing it. But you're going to see beautiful things in the world and be outside and learn things and. You have a right to interrupt anybody and ask them questions, which I love because I can't stop asking questions. So why, what is it about nature that you liked from the beginning? Why did you go into that career? Well, I guess I, I got into it from fishing with my grandfather and uncle. Um, mm. 
Uh, I noticed a lot of things on, on the streams and lakes that didn't have anything to do with fishing. It really uh, fascinated me. And I got into it from, from there. When I wrote the book, um, or the essays, Audubon, um, I had, at the same time, was writing a, a long feature length column called Insight, I N C I T E, which is really a muckraking uh, column of, of, of things that were wrong, calls to action, things we needed to fix. And a steady diet of that was um, prescription for burnout. And yes. So I wanted to uh, a respite, and uh, I retreated uh, to this, this essay called uh, Earth Almanac. First, it was called Earth Calendar, and they changed it to uh, Earth Almanac. Um, it went into the Audubon magazine, both columns at the same time, until, like everything else, they ran out of space because of the internet. And uh, that mm. eventually just withered away. But I wanted to inspire and train advocates, not with calls to action, but just with introducing them to what they can see in their backyard sometime, the beauty and magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, if, if they started noticing it and appreciating it, the advocacy would come automatically. Mm -hmm. so that's, that was my mission and hope. Well, with, with that perspective, because you said you started with Mass Fish and Wildlife in 1970, which is um, not recent. You've got 50 years of perspective. This is something I'm curious about with people right now. Do you feel that we've made a lot of improvements? Do you feel we've stepped gone forward, or do you worry that we've stepped backwards? Well, I'm old enough to remember how terrible it was in, in the 70s. Um, so we've made a lot of improvements. We, we didn't have a Endangered Species Act, we didn't have the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, we didn't have the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, DDT was being sprayed all over the place. Uh, things were, were, were pretty uh, hopeless. And uh, I had not seen a bluebird until I was about 21. And today we have bluebirds in our field. We put up bluebird boxes. We raise usually two or three broods spring. Mm. We, now they've changed their habits and they're staying all winter, uh, like the robins do. Um, we never saw a pileated woodpecker back then. We see them. I can't go out in the big woods today without at least hearing one. Uh, mm. On eagle on our lake in New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I see an eagle at least once a week. Uh, we never saw a loon. The loons were not in southern New England. Uh, they are now. Uh, we have two or three loons every constantly on our lake and we usually we usually produce a couple of chicks. So things are, it's important to report the good news as well as the bad news. And unfortunately, mm. a lot of environmental organizations concentrate on the bad news for fundraising purposes. I, I don't begrudge them with that, but the uh, problem with that is it uh, creates a feeling of hopelessness. So things are not as bad as, as uh, they're made out to be. In a lot of ways, we are making a lot of progress. Well, you know, that's really, I, I am glad to hear that because, of course, I'm the same age as you are. And um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the steel mills were busy and roaring and all kinds of things were going on. Um, and uh, I thought the world was black. Every, the, my world uh, as a child was filled with soot and smoke and your Shirts would get black if you went outside, and, and that's changed now a lot. That's really changed a lot. So uh, what I like about your book is that it gives you these beautiful little gems that you can look at, and at the same time, um, you do get a message of hope. You get a message that this is worth paying attention to, that this is worth saving. And um, I would say that here on Cape Cod, when I first came here, there weren't any ospreys, and now we have an osprey housing shortage. The osprey, there's nowhere for the ospreys to build their homes, so they'll have to get, you know, fish and wildlife, you'll have to tell them to get busy down here and create more houses. And we also have um, eagles now, which have only arrived in the last couple of years, 
and um, they were never here before. So I think that's fantastic. Certainly, there are a lot of things we need to work on, that's for sure. One of my essays is about steelhead trout, and I was recently out on um, Lake Erie. Um, uh, I'm sure you remember Cuyahoga River catching on Oh, flat. I know, yes, and, and Lake uh, Erie. I, want, I did a little tour of Lake Erie. You can now see 40 feet down at the bottom of Lake Erie. It's crystal clear, hmm. and there's a steelhead run in the Cuyahoga River. That's, that's how clean it is. That's amazing. That is amazing. So that's really nice news. I think I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago saying that um, we now have stripers in the what they call a river here in Mashpee. It's called the Mashpee River. Since I'm from Pennsylvania, I know what a river really is, but I'll let them call it a river anyway. And um, we videoed all uh, incredible numbers of stripers in this little saltwater river this summer. So things are getting better. Having said that, what would you, if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing environmentally right now, what would it be? Well, I think everybody, I think, agrees, all the environmentalists agree that it's climate change. I think uh, it's a huge problem. Um, we've got to fix that. And we've got to get an administration that, that takes it seriously. And mm -hmm. uh, right now we don't have that. Right. Well, we're all crossing our fingers. We are, right. we are all crossing our fingers. Aside from climate change, what would you do? I'll make you the head of EPA. What are you going to do to deal with things? Well, if I was the head of the EPA, I'd, I'd, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, I'd improve the Clean Water Act. It's been weakened. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I, I, uh, regulate some of the worst pesticides, um, some of the rodenticides that are uh, abused by the public, mm -hmm. second generation anticoagulants. Um, but uh, by the same token, wildlife managers have to use these um, nuclear pesticides to clear, clean out the invasive uh, rodents on islands that are wiping out native birds. Mm -hmm. the public has a hard time grasping that. I've written a lot well, of so, so I, I think what we want to do is look for moderation. Moderation in all things. That's sure. that's um that's our theme is that sometimes things will be good and sometimes they'll be bad and we need to look for that middle road. So what's your next book gonna be about? Well I don't know, you know. I, I want instant gratification. That's why I like articles better. Ah. I, I don't have the real patience to read books. I may not do another book. I, 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 want, I want to do uh, short art, magazine articles. Well, that makes this book all the more special, doesn't it? Just oh. beautiful. You, you were going to read an essay for us that you love about fishing. Okay, yeah, it's about false albacore, or little tiny. And uh, the reason I'm into it, I, I fish for them a lot. They're really cool, beautiful mini tuna. And they are the strongest fighting fish in the ocean and the worst tasting fish. They're absolutely uh -huh. Which is great because nobody's killing them. So it's all catch and release fishing. And uh, that, that's, my big thing. I was at Montauk a couple of days ago chasing them uh, without much success. I did get one, but the greatest migrations on Earth uh, don't happen in Africa or Eurasian steppes or the Arctic. They happen at Montauk. Uh, it's, hmm. it's funnel and everything goes by uh, sea turtles, sharks, whales, uh, hmm. fruit, straight bass, uh, ocean sunfish, everything. And it's, Mostly it's unseen. So part of my mission with, the, with this essay was to, to, to show people what, what's there and people that don't fish miss it. So I'll, I'll, read, I'll read about Little Tiny. Okay. Little Tiny, AKA false albacore, troll tropical and subtropical waters on both sides of the Atlantic. When ocean temperatures peak in late summer, they stream north as far as Maine and Great Britain, 
and shimmering elliptical shoals that can cover two miles on the long axis. Most people, even experienced anglers, think they're bluefish or striped bass. Watch for the sickle tails and the geysers of spray as these mini tunas swill bay anchovies and other bait fish. Often the school is attended by a cloud of screaming terns and gulls that dip and dive for leftovers. Few of these short lived bass going fish <coughs> weigh more than <coughs> 15 pounds. When they take your fly, they'll have 50 yards of line off the reel before you can snatch your bruised muscles <coughs> from the spinning handle. <coughs> At the neck of the eastern corner, inshore rips at Montauk, New York. My friends and I are at hand to watch and participate. Bobbing in little boats, we jockey for position around boils, striped bass, packed so tightly that our flies sometimes ride on their backs. Such boils happen nowhere else. Bluefish that bite off our flies and if we're careless, slash our fingers and circle the stripers. Orbiting the bluefish are the shining mini tuners, false albacore. Green backs cleave with surface faster than anyone who hasn't caught one believes a fish can swim. Bay anchovies, rain bay, erupt in panic sprays. Screaming terns and gulls pick them off along with the sand eels, silver sides, bunker herring, and mullet. Virtually from the maws of the predator fish, volleys of gannets fall into the waves as if shot by medieval archers. Sometimes, we squirt the ocean with our onboard hoses. Albies, as we're affectionately called, the false albacore, show up expecting rain bait. Out beyond the albies lurk bigger tunas, mackerel, marlin, swordfish, carnivorous sharks, whale sharks, bass fish, radial ocean sunfish, leatherback sea turtles, porpoises, and whales. So if we went to the right place at the right time, we would be able to see these fish swimming um, in shoals that are two miles wide? Well, unfortunately, I haven't seen one yet that is two miles wide. I'm hoping to. But I've, ah. I've seen one that's, you know, half a mile wide. Uh -huh. Three years ago, I left the house in Grafton on November 13th, and I had to heat the car up for 10 minutes to get the frost off the windows. And when I got to Montauk, um, I launched at Niantic, Connecticut. It was about 30 degrees, but it got warm. When the tide switched at about one o'clock from Shagwan Shoal to the Montauk Point, which is about uh, three miles, mm -hmm. it was solid false albacore. Oh, wow. Splashing, splashing the water. Uh, my son was with me, and every time we cast it, we had, we had doubled up on albies until we could our risk of tired we not enough. So they're still there. They're, even though so even though so many fish in the sea have almost all but disappeared, the false albacore are still there. That's right. Other species are being depleted, but nobody eats false albacore or hardly any. Mm -hmm. There's a market in, in New York City, uh, in, in Chinatown. And so there's a small commercial fishing uh, industry for these mm. people. But what it, what it is, is they look delicious. They look like a, they are a mini tuna. They look like a bluefin tuna, which are delicious. And uh, the Chinese buy them and they eat one and they don't buy another one. Ah. There are so many Chinese in New York City that this, this commercial market has gone on for a decade. And, now, uh, why do they why do they call it false albacore? Well, there's an albacore that's bigger. Um, it's a terrible insult for the species to be called false. But if you think of it, there are a lot of false species, like false morels. And, uh, but uh, I don't know why they call it false. But they're mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. albies mm -hmm. or little tunnies. Nice mm. Nice so can I read one of your other butterfly essays? It's again about a butterfly that flies in the wintertime. And I guess for me, at this time of year, the beautiful summer weather is gone. The angle of the sun is clearly changed. And I particularly 
dread what's coming. I don't like the winter very much. So I love the idea that there are still beautiful things out there to see, even in the winter time. Do you mind if I read punctuation in flight? Oh, please. Okay. Tis the season when even lepidopterists forget butterfly watching. And that's why finding winter butterflies can be so much fun. Species you'll meet are limited to overwintering angle wings, most notably the question mark, usually brighter than the summer form and named for the silver punctuation mark on each underwing. East of the Rockies, save the extreme north range too cold for hibernation and reinvaded by migrating adults each spring, you may encounter a flying question mark on mild winter days. That would be so much fun. I would love that. Check wood piles and outbuildings where they briefly emerge from hibernation. These butterflies rarely feed on flowers, preferring rotten fruit, carrion, dung, and sap. You may be excused if you'd rather not set out the first three of these food sources. Break off a few birch and maple branches, and you may find a question mark sipping on the sugary flow. I love that because, you know, we think of butterflies as being these beautiful fairy-like ephemeral things that flip from flower to flower. And yet the truth is that some butterflies like to eat some things that we would find pretty revolting. So how did you come to pick that one? And in particular, did you, did you just like the irony of the butterfly eating carrion and dung? Well, yes, I did. And, and our yard, for some reason, is, is a... Uh epicenter of, of question marks and, and commas. Um, I don't know if it's hmm. a lot of leaves that, that we have, or field, but uh, I see them all the time. In fact, I see them most years before I see uh, uh, morning clock. Uh -huh. And I, uh, the, the dead of winter is a misnomer. Uh, there's a lot going on in winter. You, you have to look for it, and I, I hope my readers take this away from the book. Um, for example, springtails uh, on warm, on relatively warm uh, days. Um, these ancient insects, which are 300 million years old, ah. uh, tunnel up through the snow and bounce around on the surface of the snow. They're, you know, the size of pepper grains. And mm. If you look really close, they spring. That's where they're called springtails. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to walk right by them and think that they may be just pieces of bark. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, another insect that you'll see in winter is winter crane flies. Uh, even when it's low freezing, uh, these crane flies, they look like giant mosquitoes. They, they don't bite, but they'll hover fairy-like in, 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 the, in the misty uh, sunlight. Very, very cool to, to watch those. Well, now, what, what, are they, what are they actually doing in the winter when they come up from underneath the snow? Why, why are they well, coming up from under the snow? The springtails are feeding on, on a rich ecosystem of the snow, uh, algae mm -hmm. and other things. I see. And then in, when it gets a little cold, they burrow down and wait for the next relatively warm, warm day. So there's a whole ecosystem in the snow. Correct, right. Huh. And the other thing you can look for in, in the winter is, is uh, prints of raptors. Uh -huh. Tempers are succeeded in catching rodents. And they leave big wing marks. Um, sometimes you can see patches of blood where they've been successful. So, a lot to look for out there. Mm. The you fall, just have to be more more patient. Right. And fall is one of, it may be my favorite season. And um, so I wrote about an affliction on our household called fall fever. Maybe I should read that to you. Yeah, read that. That would be great. Not immune to spring-induced giddiness, members of the Williams family are far more afflicted with the previously undescribed malady called fall fever. Feel the first symptoms on those crisp mornings just prior to the common equinox. When morning glories open on Meadow's work, 
along the south garden wall when our lake falls silent save for the lapping of waves and the gobbling of northern ducks when aspens and tamaracks go smoky gold swamp maples blaze and the azure sky is one shade richer than at any other time of year fall brings the fragrance of wood smoke and leaf smoke the sweet rotten scent of frost killed ferns and deer bitten apples Young grouse and the touch me nots, woodcocks fluttering moth like into bare alder runs at dusk, wild geese barking as if from treetop level, and yet so high they look like ribbons of crepe tacked to the corners of the crescent moon. As Joni Mitchell and our friend Tom Rush sing, they've got the urge for going and they've got the wings to go. Mm. The conditions of geese and other waterfowl are noticed by most people, even those generally oblivious to the other natural world. But the greatest migrations on Earth pass unseen by all but a few thousand Americans. And as I mentioned before, they happen not with animals in old little steps, the savannas, even with birds along the flyways, but sea creatures underwater along our west and east coasts. So that's fall fever. Fall fever. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I can't imagine you having spent your life doing anything but writing. You're such a beautiful, beautiful writer. Well, thank you, Wendy. And I, I, I told you when I think of your book, which just blew me away. The language oh. of butterflies. So whoever's listening, don't hesitate to pick that one up because stuff you learn is just remarkable. Well, um, I wonder if she wants to open up things for questions. Okay, I'm back. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Hi, Ted. That was a great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> um, we had a few, I think because we got a few get hiccups, we didn't have a lot of activity on Facebook. So, Ted, what I wanted you to do, though, I really want you to hold up that beautiful book because not only the words inside fantastic, but they did a spot on job with that cover. So, I did. It's Look at that. That is such a great cover. It's a gorgeous cover. Yeah. I was telling Ted earlier, Wendy, in the green room that um, that's one of those covers that when it's sitting on, uh, that we love at the bookstores because when it's sitting there, it's so compelling to pick that up. Mm, 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 yeah, mm. that's fantastic. So Wendy, um, you asked Ted what he's working on and he said, that's it, done. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to yeah. ask you... <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, what are you working on next? Oh, my gosh. Ted and I are opposite. I just can't stop. I actually have three different books I'm doing right now. Wow. I'm, working on, I'm working on a book about hiking. I'm work, oh, I forget What's the other one. I Oh, Ted and I have a river that we both mutually like called the Mashpee River in the little town where I live that was saved from becoming a golf course a long time ago by a woman who became a very close friend of mine. And I'm going to write a book about that process called Jean's River, but it's going to be much bigger than Jean's River, than the Mashpee River. It's just going to look at rivers in general. And my friend Jean, who managed, she, she had only a high school degree. Her mother was an immigrant. She was a single mother of three boys, and yet she heard about this golf course proposed for this riverbank and said no, and wow. she was she protected that river. I think it's just a wonderful story, and I want to tell it because I want people who are younger than Ted and I to know there's still room for making a difference in the world. Yeah. And then the other book that I really love right now is called The Heart of a Dog, and it's about my dog, who has started um, being a test subject up at Harvard to study canine brains. Wow. And it's got, it's got some interesting theories in it that I'm not going to tell about till the book is released. That's so I'm sounds, busy. You are busy. <laughs> I, and I, I just and can't I, start writing books. I, I love it. It's, you know, I, if I weren't writing books, I'd cause problems or something. Keeps you out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does keep me out of trouble. 
Um, and just real quick, I, I don't remember whether you guys talked about this at the beginning of the conversation or not, but how do you, um, Ted, how do you and Wendy know each other? Well, uh, 35 years ago, I was doing an article on Diamondback Terrapins for Audubon Magazine. And I went down um, and I interviewed um, Wendy's brother, uh, who was research, Pete Auger was doing research on it. Um, we went out and we marked a few and caught them. He mark, mark each one on the shell with a different uh, tiny cut. So he knew every turtle in this, this river. He kept track of them. It was really interesting. So I met Wendy um, at lunch. And since then, we've been, uh, you know, chatting on, on Facebook. Like I said, I read her book, which absolutely. Yep. Do you guys ever get together personally? I mean, in person? Not, obviously not during COVID, but over the last 35 years? Have there no, been opportunities? No, no, it's the only time, but we, I'm sure we will. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, we haven't. And I've always been aware of him because we should tell people we're not related. <laughs> you know, William is about the most common name you could possibly have. So, yeah. <laughs> We are the same age. We're interested in exactly the same things. We write for a living, but we are not related, and we we haven't really had a chance to spend a lot of time together. But we will. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure having both of you on with Warwick's tonight. Uh, Wendy, sorry that we couldn't see you, but we could hear you, and it was a great conversation that you guys had. Oh, great. It was so much fun. I'm sorry. the compu I don't know what the computer did. I don't want to. Oh. You know I what? I just technology. throw it. Me, you and me both, sister. It's this, you know, but it's what we're stuck with right now. So we'll make the best of it. And it was really fun to talk to you again. And um, I think maybe I'll get in my car soon and just drive up to Ted's and say howdy. There you go. Love that. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to take us off Facebook. Ted, it was great to meet you. And um, anybody at Warwick's, this would be a great, great gift for um, the holidays. And so- Oh, it's a wonderful it's, Christmas gift. It's a should, wonderful I, Christmas gift. I should, point out, Christmas gift. I should point out there happen to be two Earth Almanac books out there by coincidence. Another guy uh, wrote one a couple months before I did. His name was Ken Kiefer. It's a good book, a little different, quite a lot different. One of the differences, his cost $24.95, mine cost $60. <laughs> but, anyway. but also, I don't know how his cover is. I yeah, think that's going to be a hard cover to beat. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. The cover is, is not as good. Yeah, just so, his cover. And in the book world, we're saying October is the new December. So if you are thinking about getting a book for somebody, buy it sooner. There's going to be some supply chain issues that us booksellers are going to have. So there anyways, certainly are. Yeah. So with that, thank yeah. you, everybody. And okay. it was great seeing you. And we will say goodnight. Good See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.